Now you're talking about sneaky, dirty, underhanded people that want to kill our civilians. They want to go after our civilians. They want to kill not only our civilians, all over the world. And it's going to be stopped. It's going to be stopped. Somebody criticized me the other day because they asked me what I do. And I said, I'm going to bomb the shit out of them. It's true. I don't care. I don't care. They've got to be stopped. Why do they wait? They always wait for a tragedy to happen. They're never forward. They're always waiting for So you say, oh, wow, these were training centers, camps. By the way, what did they attack? They attacked the oil. Remember, I've been saying for two years, attack the oil. Everybody said, oh, Trump with the oil, Trump. But I said more than attack it. I said, attack it, take it, and keep it. That's what I said. So now they're attacking the oil. And a couple of the people said, you know, that was really Trump's idea. I've been saying this for two years because a big source of their wealth is the oil. They're making a million dollars a day. A lot of money making a million dollars a day. And I kept saying, why aren't we doing this? Why aren't we doing this? My fellow citizens, at this hour, American and coalition forces are in the early stages of military operations to disarm Iraq to free its people, and to defend the world from grave danger. On my orders, coalition forces have begun striking selected targets of military importance to undermine Saddam Hussein's ability to wage war. These are opening stages of what will be a broad and concerted campaign. To all the men and women of the United States Armed Forces now in the Middle East, the peace of a troubled world and the hopes of an oppressed people now depend on you that trust is well placed. So you would keep troops in Iraq after this year? I would take the oil. I don't understand how you would take the oil. Does that mean keeping troops there or, or staying involved in Iraq? You heard me, I would take the oil. The people you liberate will witness the honorable and decent spirit of the American military. So you will guarantee that we will have a presence, that we will spend money, send troops, do whatever it takes no, we'll in order make to secure money. access no, no, to oil. Money. We will make a fortune. We will make money. They have 15 trillion dollars worth of oil in Iraq. 15 trillion. We will make a lot of money. We will not lose that oil. We come to Iraq with respect for its citizens, for their great civilization, and for the religious faiths they practice. We have no ambition in Iraq except to remove a threat and restore control of that country to its own people. So your Middle East policy is basically guided by our interest in oil. My Middle East, yeah, which are, pro I always heard that. I always heard that when we went into Iraq, we went in for the oil. I said, ah, that sounds smart. Why don't we just take over the oil? We should take it over. We should come in. Well, I don't want to give it to Iran. Should we be running Iraq right now? We should be running the oil. You know, when they announced the war, and everybody smiles, oh, except the smart people. The smart people don't smile. You see, when they announced the war with Iraq, a few very smart people said, oh, that war is really smart because we're going to take over the oil. Unfortunately, Bush didn't have that in mind. You know, in the old days, you'd have a war and you'd win the war. And to the victor belong the spoils. You know that. Look at Iraq. Look at the mess we have after spending $2 trillion, thousands of lives, wounded warriors all over the place who I love. Okay, all over. We have nothing. And I said, keep the oil. And we should have kept the oil, believe me. We should have kept the oil. The people you liberate will witness the honorable and decent spirit of the American military. When I heard that we were first going into Iraq, some very smart people told me, well, we're actually going for the oil. And I said, all right, I get that. I get that. There's nothing else. I get it. But we didn't take the oil. 1.5 trillion, we should take it and pay ourselves back. Why, what are we doing? What are we doing? The old expression, to the victor belong the spoils. You remember I always used to say, keep the oil. I wasn't a fan of Iraq. I didn't want to go into Iraq. But I will tell you, when we were in, we got out wrong. And I always said, in addition to that, keep the oil. Now, I said it for economic reasons. But if you think about it, Mike, if we kept the oil, you probably wouldn't have ISIS because that's where they made their money in the first place. So we should have kept the oil. But OK. <laughs> Maybe you'll have another chance. But the fact is, should have kept the oil. 
Let's go to our Pentagon correspondent, Barbara Starr. Barbara, a lot of uh, questions about what the president meant uh, when he said maybe you'll have another chance to take the oil. I'm talking about those huge oil fields in Iraq. Uh, what are you hearing? Well, Wolf, I think it's fair to say there's a lot of raised eyebrows because the U.S. military at this point has no idea what Donald Trump is talking about when he says that. And to the victor goes the spoils. Uh, that's called pillaging, and that is something the U.S. military does not do. It's against military law. It's against international law. And today did not go any length to try and straighten that out at the White House. The new press secretary, Sean Spicer, was asked about it. Have a listen to what he had to say. Too often the United States is going in with a lot of money, a lot of manpower, and in many cases losing both uh, loss of life, um, and we want to make sure that our interests are protected. And so if we're going in to a country for a, for a cause, I think he wants to make sure that America's getting something out of it for the commitment and the sacrifice that we're making. Can you unequivocally state that this administration will not send more troops into Iraq to, as the president has put it, take the oil? I'm not going to talk about what we may or may not do. I think the president's been very clear that he doesn't telegraph forward what taking options off the table. That's not a good negotiating skill. The sections where they have the oil. They have, uh, people don't know this about Iraq, but they have among the largest oil reserves in the world, in the entire world. And we're the only ones we go in, we spend $3 trillion, we lose thousands and thousands of lives. And then, Matt, what happens is we get nothing. You know, it used to be to the victor belong the spoils. Now, there was no victor there, believe me, there was no victor. But I always said, take the oil. One of the benefits we would have had if we took the oil is ISIS would not have been able to take oil and use that oil Let me stay on ISIS, to fuel themselves. Let me uh, let's go to our military folks and Chairman Rogers. Uh, General Hurtling, I, I mean, you and I have talked about this before. This is the, the thing that Donald Trump has said from the beginning, take the oil. I, it, I, I cannot wrap my mind around the concept uh, just from a military standpoint because all I see is you're taking the oil of a sovereign nation, which is our ally, under this uh, antiquated notion of to the victor goes the spoils. They're supposedly our ally, and for the percentage of the country that doesn't hate us already, wouldn't that turn the, everybody else against the United States if we are stealing Iraq's oil? Well, not if we were in the 16th century, uh, Anderson, but unfortunately we're not. We're in the 21st. And yeah, I, I've heard Mr. Trump say that. It's, it's on a list, a long list of things that I've heard him say about what the military can and can't do. Uh, having been in northern Iraq, where a good portion of the oil is for almost two years, I can tell you, I, don't, I can't wrap my head around it either. So I'm glad he is a businessman, knows how to do that. I can't figure it out. If it's bringing other corporations in, continuing to pump, while the 19 million Iraqis continue to live and allow us to do that, that'd be great. But it's just really hard to do. Chairman Rogers, I mean, what Trump has said to, I mean, to me in interviews early on was bring in U.S. oil companies, Chevron, others, surround them while they steal the oil, surround them with troops. I mean, does that make any sense to you militarily, strategically, diplomatically? Hey, look at the time, Anderson. <laughs> I will. Let me get philosophical <laughs> about this for a moment. Really? But, we got a lot of time. We can go me, to the 10 o'clock hour if you want. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> let, just let me get philosophical for a minute. Okay, so okay. When, in the early sweep up of the war, I will tell you, this was a very popular political position amongst Republicans and Democrats. And every town hall I had sure. uh, as a member of Congress, this was an issue. People saying, well, why don't right, we have that It's popular in paper? bars, too, but it, well, it no, doesn't but mean I'm just that saying, it's, let me yeah. Let me just get to where we were. And, and my explanation what, what then would probably be the same today. We do negotiate a percentage of the revenues from that oil. Matter of fact, the Saudis were committed so much oil in certain circumstances. Other countries right. committed certain amounts of oil in certain circumstances. So when you say take it, I never did hear him say steal it. Uh, this notion of actually physically taking it out of the ground doesn't make a lot of sense to me. But this notion that a percentage can be negotiated to cover U.S. costs, okay. especially ground operations, Unrealistic. But, but that's, and by the way, that's that actually happened about. during the course right. of the war. But that is, that is actually not his plan. His plan is get Chevron, get the American oil companies in, surround them with U.S. troops. And so what you meant oil. to say is percentage of the revenue. I think I heard you say that. <laughs> uh, Colonel Layden, I mean, just from, a, you know, again, I, I just I just think of the reaction of our allies in the rest of Iraq, how they feel about, uh, you know, us taking the oil, uh, which is their future. 
It would be a non-starter for that very reason. You know, what you want to do is you want to build up countries like Iraq, where what comes after ISIS in the case of Syria uh, and, and northern Iraq. So there are going to be some significant issues uh, with this, this neo-mercantilist, uh, you know, 16th century, 18th century, whatever century you want to pick. Uh, issue here is, is something that is very similar to what you might expect a Chinese uh, military leader to say uh, in the present day, because they seem to to be developing this neo mercantilist uh, policy as well, but it is not workable for our particular time and the particular region that we're dealing with here. You want to raise the oil revenues of the countries uh, that are affected by these conflicts and you want to give them a way in which to live their lives, and uh, that would be a sustained revenue stream that would allow them to do that, right. and that would be essential. Because the, the idea of General Hurdling of to the victor goes to spoils, it implies that Iraq itself is the enemy and we have crushed them and now we're taking their oil. It, it implies more than that, Anderson. It implies that the U.S. military that's there is a mercenary force to do these kind of things. Look, there, there, were, there are 18 battlefield cemeteries throughout Europe from World War I and World War II. When you go to those grounds, the, the people who monitor those cemeteries that have U.S. soldiers in it say, this is the only place that America claims as occupied territory, the places where they buried their dead. We are not, it is not. American way of war to go and occupy a land, steal its resources, rape its women, and do the kind of things that Mr. Trump is saying. It is, again, a simplistic approach that's appealing to a certain percentage of Americans. It's worth being really specific about this. Because it's one thing to campaign for president by saying you wish the U.S. military would have looted, would have you know, pillaged, would have stolen resources from a country that we were occupying. It's one thing to run for office saying you wish that U.S. forces had committed, incidentally, that war crime and pillaged the countries that we became responsible for as an occupying force once we toppled their government. It's one thing to say that as a candidate. But once you are saying that as the commander-in-chief of the U.S. military, once you're saying, as commander-in-chief, that the U.S. military should steal the oil from countries where our military is operating, and that we might have a chance again to do that in the future. Think about what that means for U.S. troops who are on the ground right now, working with local forces in all these countries where we haven't stolen the oil, where we've never said before that we were going to steal the oil, where there were lots of local suspicions that we might and we had to defeat those local suspicions. And presumably those local forces would feel very strongly about us not stealing the oil. Think about what that means for U.S. forces serving in those countries abroad right now. On a statement that the president made on Saturday, can you, and I just want to clarify your answer here, yeah. can you unequivocally state that this administration will not send more troops into Iraq to, as the president has put it, take the oil? I'm not going to talk about what we may or may not do. I think the president's been very clear that he doesn't telegraph forward what taking options off the table. That's not a good negotiating skill. That's not how he works. There's a reason he's been successful at negotiating is because he does it in a way that doesn't telegraph to people what he's going to take on or off the table. Whether or not you are going to talk about what we may or may not do, the fact that that is on the table makes this actually not a hypothetical scenario anymore because that's policy. That's now policy. The White House, the President of the United States, has just communicated to the American people and to the world that U.S. troops in oil-producing regions around the world might be there to take the oil from these countries. That very well could be why they're there. The U.S. reserves the right to do that. Borzu Daragahi uh, is a great reporter, longtime Middle East correspondent. He's now a Middle East correspondent for BuzzFeed. Um, after the president made his take the oil remarks this weekend at the CIA, uh, Borzu in Iraq interviewed some militia fighters and Iraqi security officials who right now are working with U.S. troops on the ground in Iraq in the fight against ISIS, where again, U.S. forces are partnered with Iraqi forces to fight against ISIS. I mean, U.S. forces spent part of the last week blowing up dozens of boats on the Tigris River outside of Mosul to stop ISIS fighters from using those boats to get away from Mosul as Iraqi ground troops continued to clear ISIS out of Mosul. I mean, there are 5,000-plus U.S. troops in Iraq right now who were engaged in the fight against ISIS alongside Iraqi forces. Except now, the new president of the United States says the reason U.S. troops might be there is to get our hands on Iraq's oil. 
So Borsud Argahi talks with Iraqi fighters to get a reaction to this, and these Iraqi fighters tell him exactly what you think they would say. They, they say exactly what you or I would say if we found out that some foreign country that was ostensibly here to help us was actually here to steal America's natural resources. Quote, he cannot do it. He cannot succeed. Of course, I would fight the Americans if they came for the oil. Quote, there's no way Trump could take the oil unless he launched a new military front, and then it would be a new world war. Say these folks who are right now fighting with U.S. troops. The Senate Foreign Relations Committee tonight approved the CEO of Exxon to be America's new Secretary of State. Uh, it was a pure party line vote. Senator Marco Rubio of Florida soaked up a bunch of good press about his hypothetical courage and his hypothetical nonpartisan patriotism when he said that he might vote against the Exxon CEO to be Secretary of State because he had real concerns. But of course, naturally, Marco Rubio cast a yes vote for the Exxon CEO. The vote was a party line vote. And the Exxon CEO, Rex Tillerson, now has no barrier to being approved for that position. His vote, uh, his nomination uh, will pass on the floor as well. Simply putting an oil company CEO in charge of American foreign policy would be enough to make this a problem, right? It would be enough to ignite suspicions and recriminations worldwide that maybe American troops weren't there to help, that maybe American foreign policy is designed to steal oil from other countries, that the American military is being used as essentially a capitalist tool, as a, as, a, as a looting tool, as a pillaging tool to steal the natural resources from other countries. Having an oil company CEO be in charge of our foreign policy would be enough to create those worries. But it's not worries anymore. You're not hinting at it anymore. When the president just flat out says, yeah, that's our new policy, and then the White House spokesman backs it up. That was very dangerous to U.S. interests when it was a hypothetical, when it was a suspicion, when it was a conspiracy theory. But now it is U.S. policy. And the people who are going to face the threat from it are American troops who are already in harm's way in Libya, in Iraq, in Syria. Gordon Trowbridge was deputy press secretary at the Pentagon this time last week. Uh, today, he no longer is. And today, in his personal capacity, he said this, quote, White House spokesman needed to clearly say U.S. is not going to take Iraq's oil. Every moment that statement stands puts our troops at greater risk. If, if you are a military family, if you uh, have got friends in the military, if you know somebody who is deployed or is deploying this, we're going to take your oil, that's American policy now, we're going to take your oil, that has just shifted the ground underneath your boots. Our military has incredible technology and incredible reach, and they take incredible risks. And we as taxpayers pay an incredible price for it. But we support our troops, and we respect their sacrifice, and we worry about the dangers that they face. We do not want them to face unnecessary danger. And we very rarely have to worry that the danger that they face emanates from our own government. But until they fix this, until the new administration fixes this, they have created a daily, clear, and present big new danger for every American who is serving in an oil-producing country abroad, as if their mission wasn't dangerous enough already. I'll be right back.